was missing for two hours at the pool. What, do you guys know? Was anyone here on this call? Yeah. Yeah, but was this at? Worthington Hills. Worthington Hills. Country Club. Okay. Found at the bottom of the pool, CPR in progress, and yeah. IO was placed. Unable to pass the tracheal tube due to oropharyngeal fluid, and uh, monitor confirmed asystole. Anything else you want to mention about kind of what happened on scene there? Were you on scene with, or were you on my truck? You were on my truck, weren't you? No, no, I was in charge of the bed. Oh, that's right. <laughs> there was so much fluid coming out of this kid. Yeah. When I passed the O or pharyngeal airway, I couldn't see it. Yeah. There and the stuff that was coming out, it was it changed in colors as we were going by. The aggressive CPR was going on. His color sucked throughout the whole thing, and his pupils were fixed at that. Yeah. And. I've been on a few drownings over the years. I've never seen that much fluid. And it was continual. Yeah. And even though we suctioned and suctioned and suctioned, I mean, I, we even tipped him over to let some of the stuff run out. So hopefully that I can suction more and get it. I put the laryngeal blade in probably three, four times. And each time, straight for you weren't going to see anything. Yeah. So we ended up putting a, an eye gel in, yeah. and even once the eye gel was in, I was still getting fluid coming back up, so I couldn't get a good catenography. Um, but I mean, we, even with you know, once you bag and you get the pressure, the back pressure from the bag, there was just more fluid. Coming. So this kid was transported to Lewis Center. Yeah, chill. Yeah, the emergency room. Yeah. Up. What made you guys choose to go there? Just so still much closer. Awesome. Yeah, and the way they have advertised and educated us to Lewis Center, it's 24 hour 7 ER except for uh, admission. So, uh, what, I was six minute transport time to there versus a 12 or, or 15. 15 downtown. Yeah. And, and uh, I think they're, when I talked to the one physician up there, they could stabilize anything. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's enough a, to get him to surgery. Yeah. It is. I yeah. mean, if they if they need surgical for like trauma or surgeon or whatever, they can stabilize them. They think long enough to get them down to. Yeah. And then from Lewis Center to Nationwide, it's not a very long flight. So, right. Yeah. Um, did you guys have any hopes for this kid to actually recover? Not so really. Not realistic. Not really. I mean, when you go on drownings, and you know it's a dry drowning mostly, you know, you can see results. You can see color change. Yeah. You get, you can actually get an airway in and get some kind of, an ex, you know, you don't, just don't have that much fluid. So we figured it was a wet drowning at that point yeah. with the amount of fluid. So I was at Nationwide last month. And this case was talked about quite a bit, um, just because any time a kid dies, I mean, it's talked about quite a bit. But some basic drowning <coughs> and hypothermia management that I want to review. Early securing the airway is super important. Oxygenating of a drowning patient is extremely difficult. Um, and so I think it was a great idea to go to the ILMA after not able to get a tube in. Uh, and then once you are able to secure it with an endotracheal tube, it's high FiO2 and high P because there's a ton of pulmonary edema. Even if you're not getting fluid rushing back, the lungs have pulmonary edema, even in both is called a dry drowning, um, just from the arrest standpoint. There's a lot of pulmonary edema even from those of the uh, Obviously, early IV access, I think an IO was placed immediately in this young boy. Um, and whenever there's hypothermia, there's this process called pulp diuresis. So uh, they are hypovolemic, even if they haven't, don't appear to have lost any fluids. So they do uh, deserve a fluid bolus. We gave him about 400 yeah. cc's. And through pressure infusion. How, how big ish was he? Well, he was, uh, when we put the tape on him, he was 60, 60 pounds, right yeah. around. Um, and then, with all drownings, there's hypothermia as well, so they really go hand in hand. So, for rewarming efforts pre hospitally, it's more about just trying to prevent additional heat loss. Um, they've done a couple studies in the most drowning patients, by the time they get to the hospital, are colder than when EMS first got to them. Um, so, 
removing any wet clothes, wrapping in warm blankets, high ambient heat in the truck, those are all things that can be done to try to prevent them from getting colder. And then once they arrive at the hospital, they use extremely aggressive rewarming techniques with bladder irrigation, pleural irrigation, where you put chest tubes in and just go with warmed fluid. Um, and then the same thing with the peritoneum. And then ECMO is kind of the last step for uh, patients. Anyone who's had an arrest is hypotensive or is peri-arrest, ECMO is kind of considered the gold standard at that point, but not many sites still are doing ECMO, especially in the child. Um, so, did you guys have any longer rhythm checks besides just... This was the only, and I, I was wondering about this too, but this was the only um, portion of the EKG that printed with the report. Yeah. Uh, the act, if you go back to the true download of the entire thing, yeah. it's almost all asystole. Yeah. And I was curious to see if this was CPR on it or not, but uh, I, I, I couldn't tell. I assumed that this was CPR. That's yeah, what I did too. Because it was read and written that there was asystole, and obviously that yeah. would not But the, asystole almost the CPR. entire download is true asystole. There was nothing there. Yeah, okay. So. All right. Yeah, this, that was the, CPR. The, the other thing with hypothermia and drowning <laughs> that bradycardia is kind of the generic um, rhythm. Uh, so if you have a rate of 30, then obviously that would not, may not be a long enough rhythm check to actually check very systemically. Uh, but if there was more, that makes sense. Uh, and then under about 28 degrees Celsius, there's a high risk of inducing V-fib uh, with movement of the body. So they talk about like not shaking too aggressively and there's even some discussion out, out there about whether or not you should be doing CPR less than 28 degrees Celsius. Um, and currently the standard is still a yes. Definitely. I hadn't heard that yet. Is that okay. being tested somewhere where it's... How do you test that? I know. I, I just didn't know if anybody how, how are, are tested but studied. Is it's it just, more, it's just, more of like a theoretical... It just grabbed the person and... and yeah, exactly. Run so, with them and... So most people that advocate for that, and the same thing with giving epi and with defibrillation, argue that try for about three rounds, and if you're not getting a response, wait until you get above 30 degrees. And just rewarm. And in asystole, it's not going to help, because if you're in asystole, you're pretty much past the point of, of full recovery. But a lot of times, if you've got slow bradycardia or fine V-fib instead, um, people advocate that give a few rounds of epinephrine and try defibrillating twice. And if you don't get any progression, stop and just rewarm. And a bunch of case reports out there exist with people converting to a sinus rhythm of just rewarming. So that's kind of like research out there, but the standard of care is definitely still to do CPR. No one would fault you for doing CPR and for giving it be and for trying to defibrillate if they're in this is the Ohio State EMS uh, protocol guideline for drowning with cardiac arrest. And uh, I think that you guys did everything great. So I, I don't know entirely what happened once they got to the ED, but I think that it was called pretty quickly. I'm not sure if you guys still there when they called after it. Yeah. yeah, they re, uh, rechecked the airway because they you know the eye gel was. Yeah. So they struggled a little bit and got the airway again, and then the, you know the what's that Pe color change thing they get on Pe top? The, the, they actually yeah. got color change with that. Um, and they worked them some more. They did another IO for uh, and did some more aggressive fluid resuscitation. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't long after that. I know uh, I got a call from Loop that I think the parents were going to donate whatever they could, probably corneas, because they I don't think they put him on you know a vent or anything to, to keep him going. But so there was the possibility of that. I don't know what more they'd be willing to even take at that point with possible two hours of right. time down. Although I guess if you consider it cold ischemia rather than warm ischemia. But yeah, they needed to know uh, how much fluid we gave, and then uh, they already knew that he had been down for possibly two hours. So. Yeah. 
I think they were probably going for corneas. How do you guys handle this? I mean, a six-year-old, I find children that die much more distressing than adults. Well, our, go ahead. Our, uh, a couple of our guys noticed some of the people that were on the run <clears throat> might have been having a hard time with it. Uh, the one guy I know is an RN, and he actually picked a kid up while I was holding the air, uh, holding the head bagging. He picked him up and carried him, and you could tell he was a little quiet that day. Yeah. So they got it initiated a CISD team that night. And some guys came up and we did kind of a debriefing that night. Yeah. It was kind of good to do that. Um, kind of a pediatric theme thing. So, uh, 71, a 7 year old held on 71 in the back seat of the car with the seat belt wrapped around his neck, screaming and head turning blue. Uh, this is yours, Joe, isn't it? What more can you tell us about kind of the scene initially when you guys got there? The medic, they, they arrived on the scene just a little before us. Not much. We seen him pull up, and yeah. seen him. It was dark out. So this uh, was at night. It was, and the the car didn't have a. It was like no bulb, so it was dark in the car. You know, you just had yeah. the 71. The lights kind of at an angle, so yeah. it's hard to see. But they I seen the medic had a flashlight, and they were looking. And, when we finally got up there, they'd already cut him free, but he was—he already had like a tiki eye yeah. on his face and everything. And yeah, he was, he was choking pretty good. Yeah, and then after they cut him free, it's reported that he was essentially back to normal and was breathing fine and had no complaints at that point. So what sort of things would be concerning for this story? Well, he was uh, concerned about like circulation, blood. The how about blood? just the whole run? Or the yeah, the whole run, kind of yeah. everything going on with this. I was kind of wondering, was this a family member? Or who 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 is this with him? Is you know a single guy? Yeah, just a little kid and kind of a weird run. And so it's like, what's happening? In the documentation, he's referred to as foster grandfather. Yeah, so. whatever that means. Mm, exactly. I don't know what that means. <laughs> And then, um, but similarly, like, so a seven-year-old is suffocating and choking himself out with a seatbelt in the back seat. That seems there's something questionable there. Yeah, the the uh, the crews were real when they when they talked to me about it. Were real, they were really surprised that this older gentleman didn't take the seatbelt off from the kid. Right. Yeah. You know, it's. You know, kids do strangest things, you know, they put it around their necks. But you would think that an adult would go ahead and take the seatbelt off before EMS got there, and he never yeah. did. So, it's written that it was wrapped around his neck twice and was cut off. But if you had a seatbelt just wrapped around your neck, I was wondering the same thing. Lieutenant Craig, please come to the front desk. Lieutenant Craig, please come to the front desk. Apparently, that was the thought. Uh, so, who has to report non accidental trauma in the state of Ohio? Child abuse. Child abuse, all of us. Yeah, every single one of us. Um, every single one of us has a man mandatory duty to report um, any suspected abuse. You don't have to confirm that there was abuse, but if you're suspicious for abuse, then you have a duty to report. Usually this is done, especially in children, by the social workers at Nationwide. And, you know, I've never called Children's Services to report trauma. I don't know if any of you guys have, but um, usually the, the social worker takes care of actually calling. But any suspected abuse, it, if I had this person, I would 100% call because I don't, you know, doing the investigation to figure out what's going on is not my responsibility. It's children's services' responsibility. That's what they're for. Uh, so, similarly, the ED documentation diffuse petechiae from the entire head, uh, sclera with subjunctival petechiae, and ligature marks around the neck wrapped twice. Uh, so, this kid was in the ED for about two hours. Social work came and evaluated. And the foster grandfather was the foster father of the foster father. Uh, so the kid was in foster care, and his foster father was the person that the kid was with that day. Um, and so after they 
talk to everybody and discuss things extensively. Um, they decided that you know help was sought initially as soon as this was noted to be a problem. It was dark in the car, so it makes sense that maybe you wouldn't see what was going on in the back seat. Um, and it, it was felt that their inability to unwrap the seatbelt kind of fit with their functional abilities. So um, there was no concern for non-accidental trauma. The person was discharged from the hospital. A very strange case. A uh, 24-year-old pedestrian struck. This was about two months ago. Uh, anybody remember this by any chance? This one on 271 and 270? Maybe. I don't know. I, don't, I didn't actually have any information yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was. What so he had been at, it, it appeared he had been out the night before. Uh, car ran off the side of the road yeah. going south on 71 just before 270. And he, he looked like he might even roll his car. So he was out walking along the freeway and a semi truck driver driving. He said he saw him. And he was on the berm. And the next thing he knows, he heard a noise and saw the kid spinning around. So he you know, pulled the semi over. We got to him. He was face down, almost Trendelenburg, because the ramp was had a decent angle to it. So he's face down, and all the blood was running away from his uh, face and mouth, because I think he probably would have suffocated because of the amount of blood that was being lost. Yeah. Uh, but he had a good scalp. I mean, his scalp was lacerated pretty good. So this was really more double trauma. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. MVC um, and then struck by a... But there was no truck. other obvious extremity injuries. It just looked like he got hit and maybe the mirror or the side of the truck hit him in the head. And I couldn't tell if that was it or if he, when he hit the ground, that caused the yeah. fracture. But yeah. there wasn't a lot of other body trauma. It's not like he went flying because he was about three feet in from the berm line. And he went to Grant. So, obviously got completely hand scan, um, and yeah, all head injuries. Yeah. So, significant skull fractures underneath that head lack, um, multiple scattered intracranial hemorrhages, large subarachnoid, multiple facial fractures, and then carotid injuries bilaterally. Um, so, pretty nasty head trauma. It's impressive that it was only isolated to the head. Yeah, trauma. I was really surprised. Um, and then he went into the SICU. I tried talking with some of our residents that were over at Grant in the past two months, and neither of them were able to remember this guy, so I'm not sure how, how he turned out. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, four, the last three. note from... The I family. think he died about three days later. Yeah. So the last note that they sent over said that like he was essentially a note in their own exam. So I can't imagine he did well. And that would explain why nobody remembers him. This is a really uplifting series of cases. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it worse. Um, Sixty-four-year-old. I love the um, like complaint dispatch codes that get populated in contact with knife, sword, or dagger. <laughs> uh, Sounds like something out of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah. So dispatched for like a person down or unresponsive, something like that, and then the wife outside saying that her husband fell down the stairs, and then the body ten feet from the bottom of the stairs, surrounded by a pool of blood. Is anybody present for this? I was I, I was on the run, but I stayed <clears throat> upstairs. Yeah. But guys told me about it. Yeah. Self-inflicted. Self-inflicted. How was that determination made? He left a note. His wife, he had been, he had been being treated for depression. She was trying to get him, you know, in to see someone. She had stayed with him for the last like four days. She didn't go to work. That morning she went to work and she was calling every hour, just to see how he was doing. And then, just before the call, she called him. Didn't answer to the neighbor. She called the neighbor and he went over. And the neighbor's one who found him, right? So it was just. A, Robin's Robin's way. Way, yeah. He, uh, from what they surmise, it looked like he stabbed his belly because there was some evisceration. Uh, there were some marks on the wrist. And that might not have been doing it quick enough. So the knife went across the neck. Yeah. So middle-aged, was he white? 
I believe so, yeah. Middle-aged white men have the highest rate of success with suicide. Um, so they are, uh, tend to be very committed when they make an attempt and are very successful. This is a very concerning population for us in the ED, um, and they often get admitted because even with a kind of sketchy story, they always have access and means and um, have a high rate of success when they make an attempt. What amazed me about this was the amount, like you said, of commitment. Because they said it was from carotid to carotid. The state of mind this guy has to be is to be able to do that much to himself. Because the, other, amazing, the other parts weren't quick enough. I mean, it, it really makes you wonder about our psych care overall. Um, if his wife had to stay home with him for four days because she was get him somewhere. And because there wasn't anywhere that was available that could see him and treat him. And that's very disappointing. Yeah, they're highly educated people. And she's yeah. like, you know, they're trying to find a physical way. I mean, it's not like they hadn't gone anywhere to get a diagnosed. Right. I think it speaks, speaks to our psych care overall. Um, so, the same EMS State of Ohio guidelines have some information about when to stop a resuscitative effort. And this up here is about stopping CPR, essentially. Um, so, an arrest that's not associated with trauma, hypothermia, due to a respiratory etiology or from a drug overdose and ACLs has been carried out for over 20 minutes, and there's been no circulation for a 10 minute, five minute period, meaning they haven't had a pulse for five minutes continuously, and there's absence of any persistent current or factory attack. That's considered kind of the, it's probably appropriate to stop resuscitating efforts. I don't know what the protocol is here specifically, though. Pretty much goes right down that line. Perfect, makes sense. Uh, and then, but then the question is, when do you not even start resuscitative efforts? Um, and kind of the generic answer is obvious signs of death, um, being dependent on the rigor mortis, decapitation, decomposition, removal of vital organs, incineration, or anyone who has a DNR form. Which is why you should always keep your DNR form in your pocket. Questions about any of this? So, since cases, I feel like every time I go to Nationwide, we go for about a month at a time, I see a SIDS case. Have you guys had any experience with SIDS cases? It's over the years. Long time. Yeah. It's been a while. Out. So, because of these kind of signs of obvious death, maybe you wonder about these SIDS cases. Almost all kids are in kind of the two to six month range. And there were a couple case series up to over 100 patients. 0% survival in a kid with SIDS. Um, and typically, these babies are stiff and there's dependent lividity. It actually only takes a couple of hours for that to develop in a child. It happens much faster than um, in an adult. I don't know why. Um, but it, only a couple hours, and there's these very obvious signs of death. But at Nationwide, they're usually brought in not as deceased, but transported. And so why do that? And I think probably the biggest thing is for your safety. Because um, in the home, who knows how that family is going to deal with the death of this last night healthy and now dead four or five month old. I think mentally, a lot of us think about the survivors at this point. Absolutely. And over time, it's easier if they died at the hospital versus at home. The, the other thing you know is, I mean? though, we don't know how that child died. Exactly. By bringing them in, it starts the system. Yeah. You know, was it a SIDS case or was it a case of somebody suffocating the child? Yeah. We have no idea. Absolutely. What's the current recommended like preventative position for infants? On their back. No, by themselves. With nothing. With nothing. With nothing. With nothing. It seems uh, like it goes all over. You know, yeah. in a couple of years it changes. That. Yeah, it's probably different tomorrow. But. Um, yeah, so all of these babies get uh, full x-ray series to look for fractures or any other sign of trauma. Um, and obviously there's social work and other services available at the hospital where they are used to these cases. Um, so do you think you should do CPR then if you're transporting one of these babies? Should you start CPR in the room and 
continue it all the way to the hospital. If there's dependent lividity and there, I would think going down. We we have nothing in our protocol that says that we can just transport a dead person. Right. Okay. Right, so you certainly can't pronounce them because then you can't Yeah, and them. so if we don't pronounce them, we have to do something. So I think I've had three cases over the past year and a half, and there's kind of been a different degree of care provided in all of them. So one kid showed up with them actually still doing chest compressions and was intubated and then back. Um, one kid showed up being bagged with just an EVM, and um, some compressions had been done on scene initially, and one kid showed up, no compressions had been done at any point, and they weren't bagging. And all three of them were encoded as pediatric arrest, uh, CTR in progress. And all three of them had the exact same outcome, they got there, we went, okay, time of death is now this time. Um, so I, I don't think it really matters, because if there's obvious signs of death, if there's dependent lividity and they're stiff, nothing you do is going to help. It's more just for whatever is going to help you feel the best and whatever is going to provide the most support to the survivors. Like you said. From a medical standpoint, I, I think if you want to do nothing, I think that's acceptable. If you want to do CPR all the way there, I think that's acceptable. Is SIDS still a diagnosis of exclusion? Yes. So are you saying any infant I can't say that because we have it in our protocol that if you you know if there's we have a that that line in there if there's obvious signs of death and such we don't have to start right but if they do transport I don't have a problem with it but if it if they don't they're going by our protocol but it's also one that the police are going to be involved in instantly because it's a death at home. Yeah. So that's yeah, not like tampering with a potential crime scene by removing the body or anything like that. That's not a worry for us. I don't think okay. so. No, but I haven't heard that from the detectives at Nationwide. Okay. They're, they're always very supportive of everybody um, because these cases are extremely tough. Um, he was actually on that 64-year-old male. He was there if you had any other specific questions. Oh, I probably did it by accident. Okay. Because <laughs> so, I know you mentioned that the cardiologist wanted to come and talk. Yeah, he's still going to come in, okay. Dr. Rund. I wasn't Rund. sure if he was going to be here today. No, so Dr. Rund uh, just hasn't arranged it yet. It's coming from him. So, awesome. I yeah, there are times I get confused on what I've already said. Is that this crew that was here last time that we talked about this case? I don't think so. This? No? Okay. Let's just go through it quickly then because it, it, it is a really good EKG progression. So this is a 69-year-old, acute onset, 10 out of 10, substernal chest pain, uh, no radiation, was nauseated, but no vomiting. What? You were on it? Perfect. Because last time I don't think anyone was on it, so it must have been a different crew than last time was on it. Sorry, well, after having a heated argument. Um, so, some <laughs> historical factors, there's four things that increase the likelihood of an acute MI. Those are symptoms that worsen with exertion, um, associated vomiting but not nausea, associated diaphoresis and radiation into either the right shoulder or both shoulders or the neck but not just the left shoulder. All the other things don't actually increase the odds of it being an acute MI. So this patient received aspirin, nitroglycerin, oxygen, fentanyl, zofran. This was the initial EKG. Um, and so there's a bunch of them in here, so we'll go by the times. Let's see here. So this is 2.30. Uh, which obviously shows this anteroceptal step with some PVCs. And then at 233, there's now almost this inferior STEMI pattern, and the anteroceptal T waves are inverted. And then at 235, this is pretty similar, uh, but now you're having even more PVCs and still this kind of 
inferior semi portion, you're getting a widening of the QRS complex. It looks more irritable. It looks very irritable. Uh, and then 239, you still have a widened QRS. Um, fairly similar. And then at 242, that inferior STEMI pattern's gone away. The QRS has narrowed again, mostly. And now you have this ST elevation again developing in the septal leads. And then 246, it's kind of back to the initial EKG. So this was over the course of 15 minutes. I think that's crazy. It makes me think I should be checking serial EKGs much more frequently. <laughs> One of these, there was no stemming at all. So, yeah. So, so what is the specific concern with these septal stems? I mean, why did you code on the table? Well, it affects both sides. Yeah. And who said that it looks irritable? I mean, that's yeah. the issue. Your whole conduction system goes right down the septum, and it's not getting yeah. any blood flow. It's irritable. It's, uh, it's yeah. extremely irritable. So he did code once or twice on the table. This is his camp. Uh, this is pre-intervention. This is where his LAD stopped with 100% occlusion. And then this is his LAD after they ballooned it open. Um, so they got Ross right away after he coded on the table. Um, <coughs> he had multiple runs of VT after catheterization to um, reperfusion to this, the septum also makes the heart irritable, and there's frequently VT and VFib afterwards. Usually they're fairly short and uh, self-correct. Um, but he got discharged with a life vest on, following up. So from first medical contact to balloon, 39 minutes. I think that's excellent. Only on scene for six minutes, that's great. And transport time of 18 minutes. Can't did. did you get right to the lab? You went yeah. straight up. Oh, she went straight up. Yeah. I've heard that some other hospitals in town do not go straight. Now you can do ladder one on one. It's been our experience that OSU's.